But earlier this last week or so has been filled with all kinds of end of the year activities celebrating that that end of the school year for the kids. Um, they're now our, our kids in Cannon Falls now at least are home. Um, and we get to look back now at this whole year. We've seen how much they've grown and changed in just a, a year, all the things that they've learned. Um, I know a lot of our kids are, are growing physically a lot at this time of life, and sometimes it's, it's a little daunting as a parent to be thinking about that, how fast they grow, but at the same time, it's, it's exciting to see our kids grow up and mature, and as I said, to see that those gifts that God gives them start to be expressed. We just acknowledge these graduates from high school, and there's been all kinds of activities over the past couple of weeks, uh, recognizing those graduates and all their accomplishments, and really trying to, to speak to their future. We ask for God's blessings on their future as they continue to, to move on and take those early steps into adulthood, as I said, that they start pursuing their own dreams in life. And as they go, we pray that God would bless them and give, and give them success in life. And as you think about that, you start to think about what success means. Success is something that we all want in life. But what does success really look like? How do we achieve success? I think it's an important question to ask because there are a number of different ways that people define success, but not every one of those ways really brings the kind of success that they're looking for. People can set out on a certain path only to find they took the wrong path, and it doesn't fulfill the promise that they thought it had. So I want to ask today, how do we define success? And one of the ways we think about success is in terms of just accomplishing goals. You know, we set out, set out goals for ourselves, we work toward them, we achieve them, we have success. And in that way, we can all look back on many times in our lives where we've had successes in life. There's plenty of people who've reached goals in their life, but at the same time, there's people who've reached those goals and still feel unsatisfied and unfulfilled. And not all goals necessarily lead to good things. We tend to think about um, goal setting as a positive and powerful motivation for achieving accomplishments, but there's actually been some research done into showing the negative side of this goal setting mentality. There was a study done at the University of Arizona in which students were asked to just take some letters and create words out of them, kind of play a, a word game. Now, some of these students were given a goal to pursue, a certain number of words to accomplish. Some of them were even told they'd get a financial reward if they reach that goal. Another set of students wasn't given a goal at all. They just said, go do the task and see what you can do. And they studied the results after, and what they found is that the students that were given a goal had a much higher incidence of cheating. They cheated to get to the goal. So was that success? Is this, does success come no matter how we achieve our goals? I think we'd all agree that that's probably not right. Sometimes our goals also push us further than what's really good for us. People have cited examples of exercise goals that push them too far or beyond their physical limits, and they end up injuring themselves worse. Or the focus on goals causes them to sacrifice other important areas of their lives, such as relationships with friends and family. So sometimes the goals we set have a negative consequence. We can even unconsciously be um, setting goals for ourselves to be like other people because we think they have things that we ought to have. And we end up sacrificing our own unique character and the, 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 the call that God has in our life. So setting goals in itself isn't necessarily a bad thing, but I don't know if that's necessarily the right definition of success and achieving a successful life. It's not just accomplishing goals because there's something about the character it produces. Now in our culture, there's a certain... Um, image of a successful person that's pretty predominant. The kind of person who has it all. They have all the money they could need, all the possessions they could want. They have power and influence. That's what we often perceive as being a successful person. But I think we also all know that money, possessions, and power don't necessarily give you the best things in life. With increased wealth and power come increased burdens to maintain them. People often have to make those serious sacrifices I mentioned earlier in order to attain those things. And many times they end up feeling miserable and lonely. So again, there's more than just success than what you get in the end. You also have to ask how a person achieves that wealth. And we also have to understand that these are the kinds of things that can be lost suddenly. Um, there's a book I'm reading right now called Fueling Vision by a man named Brad Oster. He helps build churches all over the nation. 
and he wrote this book for advice on a, a common pastor's guide to uncommon success, he called it. And in the introduction of this book, he says that he has owned four real estate development companies. He's been a millionaire twice. He's owned six Ferraris, $2 million homes, and a $3 million estate, and a couple of airplanes. And he writes, I've learned more than once that rich can be taken away from you. People have asked me what it feels like to lose luxurious lifestyle, nice cars, estates, and bundles of money and need to start over again. He says, my answer surprises them, and it might surprise you as well. The biggest regret does not come from losing equity or possessions. It comes from having spent the money on those things in the first place. He talks about losing their $3 million estate and says, I wasn't sad that we lost the house. My deepest regret was we had simply stayed that had we simply stayed in a smaller home, we could have put millions into ministry all over the world and nobody ever could have taken that away from us. So true success isn't something that we can buy. People pursue these things only to find themselves losing them. They find themselves hurt and they find themselves regretting what they've done. Could have chosen a different path. And honestly, I don't know that that is really what most of us are looking for. When we say we want to be successful, I don't know that most of us are really wanting to be that rich, powerful person that's often portrayed in culture. There may be a certain cultural pull toward accumulating things and money. But if we really thought about it, I think most people would probably not say that's what they really want out of life. What lies behind most of the things that people pursue is a desire to find joy and contentment in life. I think that's what we really want. A successful life is one that we can be at peace with. We're happy with the life we have. We can look back and we can be satisfied with the things that we have done and the way that we have achieved them. I think this is closer to a true definition of what success in life is. But there's some challenges even with this definition. Life continues to throw obstacles in our way. Things that destroy our contentment. People disappoint us. The things that we do get get damaged and worn out and dirty. The things that we work at require more work from us. Things change and we have to relearn things that we've learned before. People come behind us and undo the work that we've worked so hard to do. Or the people that we love develop health problems. And all of these things make it difficult for us to just be happy with life. So many people who spend their life pursuing these goals of peace, and joy, and contentment end up being stressed and worn out and sometimes even angry and bitter about life. And there's nothing we can do to change those circumstances that keep coming at us. So is there really any hope for achieving success, that real success that comes from having a contentment in life? And the answer is yes. But it doesn't come from those accomplishments. It doesn't come from working hard to just get to a certain point where you can finally rest and enjoy life for the rest of your days. True success, where you find lasting peace and joy and contentment results from becoming a certain kind of person. It's found in becoming the kind of person who can find all of these things that I mentioned, peace and joy and contentment and hope, in a world that is constantly changing and throwing challenges at us sometimes even painful challenges. And in order to do this, to become this kind of person, we need to have something outside of ourselves, something that will guide us and motivate us in the way that we need to go, something that will teach us, give us positive wisdom, something that will pick us up when we fall down and give us strength and hope when we ourselves feel weak, something that will um, prod us to keep going in the right direction when we want to stop and give up. And something to tell us when we have gone the wrong way and convict us to turn back around. So working through all these things and having that source that helps us do all these things that true success in life is gained. And in the next chapter of the story, we see the Apostle Paul demonstrating this kind of success in his life. The last part of the book of Acts tells us about Paul's final journey when he traveled to Rome. And you see all the challenges that he faced along the way. You see the kind of person that I'm talking about who has true contentment in life. The way he approaches this journey shows us that kind of life. And in the last, in some of his final letters that he wrote to us, he tells us how he gained his success. So I want to consider those things today. The first thing I want to do is take a look at the last part of Paul's journey. We're going to be reading from the book of Acts together. So if you have your Bibles, open up to, to Acts 20 to begin with. And um, let me just set this up for us. 
So we know from the previous chapter that Paul, that after meeting Jesus, Paul went on three great missionary journeys. He went all over the ancient world sharing the gospel. Um, if you were here last week, I had a map of all his journeys on the back of your sermon notes page. I actually have another map today. That one just shows the, the last journey that he took. Um, you can follow along with that. So he traveled all over these areas. And in Acts 20, we read that Paul is on his way back to Jerusalem after the last of these. He wants to get back before the Pentecost, which we remember from a couple weeks ago is the, the day the Holy Spirit came upon the, the disciples. It's really the, the, the celebration, the anniversary of the birth of the church that we're all a part of. And at one of his stops, Paul sends for the elders from the church in Ephesus. And in Acts 20, starting in verse 18, we read what he tells them. When they arrived, he said to them, You know how I lived the whole time I was with you, from the first day I came into the province of Asia. I served the Lord with great humility and with tears, although I was severely tested by the plots of the Jews. You know that I have not hesitated to preach anything that would be helpful to you, but have taught you publicly from house to house. I have declared to both Jew and Greek that they must turn to God in repentance and have faith in our Lord Jesus. And now, compelled by the Spirit, I am going to Jerusalem not knowing what will happen to me there. The only thing, I, I only know that in every city the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardships are facing me. However, I consider my life worth nothing to me if only I may finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me, the task of testifying the gospel of God's grace. So as he's journeying back, he's hearing, he's sensed in his prayers and he's hearing in his conversations with others that something bad is going to be happening to him in Jerusalem. And yet he's going to continue on. He doesn't hesitate. He doesn't turn back. He doesn't stop. He continues on. He leaves the, the church in Ephesus with some final instructions and prays with them. And then sails on and home and arrives at the home of Philip. And in Acts 21, we read about a prophet named Agabus coming to Paul. He comes and takes Paul's belt and binds his own hands and feet with it. And he says, the Holy Spirit says, in this way, the Jews of Jerusalem will bind the owner of this belt and will hand him over to the Gentiles. The Holy Spirit is warning that there's going to be danger ahead for Paul. And all of his friends encourage him now to turn away. They say, don't go to Jerusalem. You're just going to get in trouble there. We'll take you somewhere else. But Paul says, why are you weeping and breaking my heart? I am ready not only to be bound, but also to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. He would not be convinced to go any other way. He simply continued on the path that God laid before him. And Paul had an incredible sense of peace about this, knowing that God, this was the Lord's will. And whatever the Lord wanted for him, he wanted to pursue that. He was ready to face it. This is that contentment that with life, no matter what the circumstances that I was talking about. Now, there are many Jews in Jerusalem who knew all about Paul's work among the Gentile people, and they accused him of abandoning, of abandoning the ways of the Lord. When he arrived in Jerusalem, he t attempted to go to the temple there and purify himself and make the, the proper sacrifices at the temple. But the people saw him there, and, and a riot broke out in the city. They drug him from the temple, and they were about to kill him when the Roman guards came in. Word got to the Roman captain that something was going on in, down by the temple. And so he came down, broke up the fight, grabbed Paul, and tried to figure out what was happening. Now at that time, Paul shared with the whole crowd his story of how he wanted to stop the Christians at first. But Jesus himself...